This is lecture number three in a series of four lectures on the three epistles of John. And we're on Roman numeral six now. We said that the book of First John, the epistle of First John, is epistle of the fellowship. And we looked at the source, the purpose, the requirements, the tests, and the maintenance, and now the family members in this fellowship. And in First John chapter 2, uh, verses 13 and 14, uh, John actually beginning with verse 12, John says, I write unto you little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children, because ye have known the Father. Actually, John lists three uh, groups of believers in the family of God here, uh, little children, young men, and fathers. And uh, we don't have a lot in the notes on this. Uh, we've just sort of listed them here. Uh, some time ago, I uh, did a study of salvation, of course, to uh, prepare my notes for the doctrine of salvation. And uh, one of the most helpful books along this line is Dr. Robert G. Gromacki's book, Salvation, is forever. Dr. Gromacki is professor of New Testament at uh, Cedarville College in uh, Cedarville, Ohio. It's a GARB school, the Baptist school. And uh, he has an excellent summary here, and this may help us along the line here, the family members. And he says that John divides the group into three here, of course, little children, young men, and fathers. And Dr. Gromacki suggests that actually Christians uh, in the family of God may be considered uh, in, by a fourfold division, uh, the mature, the immature, the carnal, and the spiritual. And let me read that. It's a little, rather lengthy passage that he has here, but uh, I, think it's, I think it's excellent. I've never seen it broken down this way. He said, uh, What then are the biblical principles underlying spiritual maturity? A mature believer should be able to teach others both from his knowledge of Scripture and from his years of Christian living. <clears throat> As a spiritual adult, he can prepare his own meals from the Scriptures. He does not have to be nursed or spoon-fed. His spiritual senses have been sharpened to make correct moral decisions. His spiritual body, his mind and muscles, is well-conditioned and coronated. Uh, uh, now, that is a uh, mature, and now an immature Christian. He says he is just the opposite. Bible teachers have a hard time trying to make spiritual truth simple enough for him to understand. He is dull of hearing, apathetic, indifferent at times to the preached word. He has been saved long enough to be a spiritual college graduate, but actually he is still in the first grade learning his spiritual ABCs. He is ignorant of basic Bible principles. Therefore, he cannot relate the scriptures to his daily practical problems. He has to be told what is right or wrong. He cannot make that distinction by himself. He is entirely dependent upon others. He has no spiritual maturity of his own. The need of the immature man is growth. Maturity involves time. Christians can be found at each level of the maturing process. Each day should move one that much closer to conformity to Jesus Christ if he learns, works, and makes decisions under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Too often, however, some have been saved for 20 years but have the spiritual aptitude of a five-year-old. Those wasted years cannot be regained but the person can begin to grow if he applies himself. In the natural realm, suppose you, had, you have a perfect ten-year-old boy. His development may be ideal up to that point, but there is still room for growth. So it is with a Christian. He may have growth for ten years, a perfect ten-year-old, but there is still room for improvement. Christians are often criticized needlessly and wrongfully. Many of the critics are totally unaware of the different types of believers there can be. Now here he zeroes in on the four. First, a Christian could be both immature 
and carnal. This means that he has been saved just a short while and that he has not yielded to the indwelling Holy Spirit. So if you've just been saved and then you sort of uh, still have habits that you're not willing to give up, you're both immature and carnal. You're immature, you haven't grown, and you're carnal, you're not yielded to the Holy Spirit. Now, second, a Christian could be mature but carnal. Yes, a spiritual leader, like an evangelist, pastor, Bible professor, or head deacon could know the Word and have walked with the Lord for a long time and yet for a given moment be yielded to self rather than to the Spirit. So that means that he would be mature because he's been a Christian a long time, but that particular moment be carnal. Uh, Dr. John Walvert, the president of Dallas Theological Seminary, once remarked to the class, the closer you get to the spiritual giants, the more you realize that they too have feet of clay. Third, a person could be immature but spiritual. This believer could be totally yielded to God and yet make mistakes because of his inexperience. So let's go back and review now. You can be immature and carnal, or you can be mature and carnal, or you could be uh, immature but spiritual. This believer could be totally yielded to God and yet make mistakes because of his inexperience. Fourth, the ideal believer is both mature and spiritual. He has developed from spiritual infancy to adulthood and is also yielded to the indwelling Christ. So I think that's what John is attempting to bring out here, that the believer is to be, uh, these that have been saved are to be mature and to be spiritual at the same time, and that's the goal. But he writes to three different individuals here. I don't know how to interpret this, little children, young men, and fathers, except to say that perhaps the little children are those new converts, the young men are those that have been saved for a while, could be young women too, young converts, and then the fathers are those that uh, perhaps have known Christ for, for many years. But here we have the family members in this fellowship. And then Roman numeral 7, the enemies of this fellowship. Um, Jesus said, In the world ye shall have tribulation, and we are to expect persecution, the Bible tells us that if we would live godly in Christ Jesus and for the Lord, we are to suffer, expect to suffer persecution and to be opposed uh, by the devil. In fact, the world, the flesh, and the devil are all three teamed up to uh, drive us from this fellowship of God. They cannot drive us from the family, but they can prevent the fellowship that should exist in this family. And, of course, that's what this uh, section is about here. John here lists at least three terrible foes which the believer must be on guard against, lest his walk for Jesus be marred. All right, now notice the passage of Scripture here in chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, the systems of this world, and that's the first enemy. There's the world, the flesh, and the devil that would mar us or that would... Uh, uh, prohibit, prohibit that fellowship that God wants to exist between himself and the family believers. Love not the world, John says, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, uh, 2 Peter 3, we have studied that. And the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, what is the world here? And, of course, we have uh, three worlds mentioned in the Bible, as you can see in your notes. We have the physical world, and uh, that's not the world, uh, basically, that John has in mind here in Acts 17. Uh, the Bible speaks of this physical world, uh, God, Paul said, who made the world and all things in it. So the physical world is the planet Earth, that great big uh, ball, that sphere 
uh, that, uh, that goes around the sun once a year. It's 25,000 miles in circumference and about uh, 8,000 miles in diameter and weighs about seven septillion tons. Uh, that's the physical world. And he's not saying not to love that uh, body of uh, earth and water. That's another world. And then there's the human world, of course. Uh, John 3:16. God so loved the world. And that means the world of men. But that's not the world he's talking about here either. But it is the evil world, uh, the world that Jesus spoke of in John 12 and uh, verse 31 when he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And it's the world that Jesus meant in John 15 verse 18 when he says, If the world hates you, Ye know that it hated me before it hated you. So the evil world, the systems of this world, are the things that God hates and that God will someday destroy and that the believer is to have no part of. Um, a believer lives, someone has said, on the first world. He's a member, because he's a man or a woman, of the second world, but he must avoid the third world. And so one of the, one of the uh, great enemies of fellowship is worldliness. And worldliness uh, has been defined as uh, any act or attitude that would keep me uh, from putting Jesus Christ first in my life. Uh, so good things might develop into worldliness. Uh, good literature if one spends uh, more time there rather than in the Word of God, or uh, wholesome sports, uh, football, basketball, baseball, these things can become worldly if they replace uh, in our affections uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, now, the divisions of this world are three. There is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the divisions within this world system that we are to avoid. And I think as John penned these words, his thoughts may have gone back uh, to a beautiful garden and maybe to a terrible wilderness where two individuals were subjected to these satanic temptations by the devil himself. Uh, there was Eve in the beautiful garden in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. The Bible says that apparently she was subjected to all three worldly systems, the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life. Uh, the Bible says that the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and this, of course, appealed to the lust of the flesh, and then that it was pleasant to the eyes, and here's a reference to the lust of the eyes, and then a tree to make one wise. And here is an appeal to the pride of life. Uh, the first was an appeal to the physical, the second to the mental, and the third to the spiritual. Uh, and then the Lord Jesus, of course, uh, in the garden temptation, was subjected to all three. Uh, the first temptation, command that these stones be made bread. Here's an appeal to the lust of the flesh. The, uh, the flesh was hungry. It wanted food. And then another temptation, Satan showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. He said, feast your eyes upon those. You can have those. Well, here's an appeal to the lust of the eyes. And then, of course, the <clears throat> third temptation, uh, he told him to cast himself down from the pinnacle of the temple and uh, force the hand of God because God would be then obligated to give his angels charge uh, concerning thee, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. And uh, this would be an appeal then to the pride of life. Uh, that is to say, uh, with the knowledge that, that God uh, the Father would have to do what Jesus told him to do. And that wasn't the priority, that wasn't the order of the Trinity at all. It was the Father that would give the orders and the Son would obey. But now here, the Son was tempted to, uh, to say, I will do my own thing, and this is, of course, an appeal to the pride of life. Uh, the deceitfulness of this world, we have here a lengthy quotation uh, from Dr. Warren Wiersbe, 
and uh, I won't be reading this uh, here, but uh, the deceitfulness of the world is this, simply uh, that this world will someday pass away. And these verses, as we've already stated, uh, ought to be tied in with Second Peter uh, chapter 3. And perhaps I need to go back and just briefly read these here. Uh, he says uh, to remind us in verse uh, 10 of chapter 3 of Second Peter, he said, But the day of the Lord, now that's the uh, tribulation, of course, shall come as a thief in the night. Actually, it's a reference really to the battle of Armageddon and uh, to those traumatic events that will take place between Revelation chapter 20 and Revelation chapter 21. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away. See, Peter agrees with John that the world's going to pass away with a great noise and the elements shall men have found about to what? A little over a hundred different elements. They've classified various elements now. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in it shall be burned up. And then Peter says, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy living and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, in which the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. A few years ago I was in uh, Southern California holding a series of meetings and Bible seminars, and I got a hold of a Los Angeles newspaper, and I saw an entire ad, an entire page, uh, given over to uh, a car ad introducing the new Rolls-Royce automobile. And uh, you could get them for a mere $90,000. Now, that's right. That's nine zero comma zero 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 ninety thousand dollars $90,000. And I thought, as I read that, there must be a typographical error. Uh, I can understand a car may be costing uh, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand, but but surely uh, not ninety thousand. But it was no typographical error. Now, can you imagine someone spending ninety thousand dollars for a car like that, only to see the atoms and the electrons and the protons and neutrons dissolve with a loud noise? All that is. You're paying $90,000 for some electrons, protons, and, and neutrons. Well, the Bible says that this world shall pass away. And this is what uh, Peter says, and this is what John says. All right, now, let's look at not only the uh, divisions in this world, as we've already talked about now, but the seducers of this world, not just the, the flesh and the pride of life and... Uh, these other things, but in chapter 2, verse 18, John says, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now, he, he says this, and it's interesting. He said, Ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. So, apparently, John is referring now uh, to second, uh, let me see, probably second Thessalonians chapter two, John is referring to some of Paul's writings, uh, because, uh, <clears throat> John doesn't talk about the Antichrist up to this point. So he assumes that they read about it. And he said, well, you've read first and second Thessalonians probably because Paul had written those before that time, of course. And, and you know, uh, that uh, Paul speaks about the coming Antichrist. So it's interesting, we've already seen how Peter refers to Paul, and now John seems to refer to Paul. And what we're saying is this, that the New Testament writers were familiar with other New Testament writers. They read them, and they studied them, and they believed them. Peter uh, read Paul and James and the rest, and James read uh, all those two. And so we need to read if, if those authors of the New Testament who wrote uh, inspired Scripture thought it important uh, to refer to other New Testament writings and to heed them, how much more we ought to do that also. But uh, 
So he's probably referring to 2 Thessalonians 2. As ye have heard that the Antichrist shall come. He said, that's true, but I want to tell you, uh, folks, uh, as members of the family of God, that even now, right now, there are many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. Now, the many Antichrists there, uh, doubtless, were many uh, people, false teachers of that day. You see, an Antichrist, there will be one Antichrist, of course, who will come during the tribulation, but there are many Antichrists living today. I could name some. Uh, an Antichrist, of course, would be an individual, man or woman, uh, who would pretend to be of God, but actually be uh, opposed to God. I don't think that Fidel Castro could be concerned an Antichrist, because in a sense he is, but, but see the word anti in the Greek often refers, usually refers, not to uh, one who is against Christ, but one who is an imitator of Christ. And uh, Fidel Castro is an antichrist in the sense that he's against Christ, but, but uh, the real danger is the imitation Christ. Now, when the antichrist comes during the tribulation, apparently he won't come, at least for the first three and a half years, as a man who was opposed to Christ, but as a man who's going to imitate Christ, who's going to lead people to believe that he is from God. And then he'll claim to be, of course, God, and he'll drop all pretense during the middle of the tribulation. Uh, but uh, you have uh, many religious professors today who are actually antichrist, even though they, uh, they may use terms like the resurrection and the Bible and the eternity and salvation and, and uh, the spirit of Christ and and the, the godliness of Christ, yet they're antichrist because they attempt to, to imitate uh, the plan of salvation through good works or through, through something else. So he says that we need to beware of the seducers of this world, those who pretend that they are of this fellowship, but who in reality are antichrist. Now, here's the test in chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. I think there's a classic illustration here. There's a certain school I will not mention, and it's certainly not their fault, I, I bet I won't mention the school, it's uh, very similar to the uh, Liberty Baptist College and Thomas Road Bible Institute as far as uh, a fundamental school that takes a stand for the book, The Blood and the Blessed Hope. At any rate, they had a graduate from their school a number of years ago uh, who went out and is now pastoring probably the most liberal church in America. It's in New York, and of course I refer to uh, the church that uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick uh, pastored for many years, and the church that uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller helped build there uh, in New York City. And this uh, church uh, has uh, never, to my knowledge, although it's one of the most prestigious churches in America, has never uh, even come close to believing anything in the Word of God. Fosdick uh, was a, a blatant liberal, in fact, almost an agnostic. And uh, then he died, oh, about 10 years ago, and then they had a fellow by the name of McCracken, and he came in, and he pastored the church, and he was just as, as uh, notorious in his theology. The third pastor of that church is a graduate of a fundamental Bible school. Now, it's certainly not the fault of the Bible school, uh, but apparently uh, this fellow was never saved. I don't know why he went to one of these schools, but uh, he came out of them, but John says, they were not of us, for had they been of us, they would have continued with us. And now he's pastoring that church. And I'm sure if, if the Thomas Rowe Bible Institute and Lynchburg or Liberty Baptist College and the seminary continues, I mean, if Jesus tarries and we have a number of years, uh, we'll have uh, this same tragic experience also. But maybe it's good because... Uh, that will separate them, the believers, from the non-believers. All right, he goes on to say in verse 22, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. 
Uh, may, many say, um, I think you're too hard, perhaps, Wilmington, on the Jehovah Witnesses and on the Christian science, uh, Christian scientists and uh, on the, uh, the Mormons and the Herbert W. Armstrongs and the rest. Well, I'm not nearly as hard as John was. He says they are liars, and he says that they deny that Jesus is the Christ, and all the cults deny this, and we are to deny the cults, of course, a hearing in our presence because of that. These things, verse 26, have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. And this word seduce has to do with sexual as well as with mental uh, seduction. Uh, we think sometimes that uh, we hear cases, of course, of, of uh, young girls that perhaps are naive and they're rather silly and they're, uh, here some uh, Casanova comes along and seduces them. Uh, well, this is what John is afraid that will happen to some of these immature believers. They will be seduced uh, by these antichrists, these imitation Christs. Now, uh, in chapter 4, verse 1, he speaks uh, also of, uh, along this line, he says, Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit. And then in chapter 1, he says, of, verse, of chapter 4, verse 1, he said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now, that were true, as, as it was, of course, in John's day. How much more is it true in our day when we actually live, perhaps in the very generation that will see uh, the rapture and perhaps the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So these are now some of the enemies uh, that would separate us uh, from that fellowship. The systems of the world will do it, the seducers in this world will do it, and the spirits of this world. So the systems, that's an impersonal thing now, and the seducers, these are human beings, and the spirits, these are demons. So you have the systems and you have the, the sinners, and you have demons. And uh, it's, a, it's a battle, and as we said, uh, God wants us to know that we're in a battleground and not a playground. Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but gang, we do wrestle against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, the source of our fellowship, the purpose, the requirements, the test, the maintenance, the family members, the enemies, and now the promises of this fellowship. Uh, there's uh, five promises that we have uh, gleaned from John's epistle here. Everlasting life with Christ, boldness and service down here, confidence at the rapture, confidence at the judgment seat of Christ, and receiving a new body like his resurrected body. Look at these briefly. Everlasting life with Christ. And this is the promise, John 2, verse 25, that he hath promised us even eternal life. And then boldness and service down here in chapter 4. I'm going to read this. And uh, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath punishment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So there's boldness and service down here. Then there's confidence at the rapture, one of the promises of this fellowship. In chapter 2, verse 28, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And this leads me to believe that John teaches here there will be some that will not have that confidence when he comes even though they'll be caught up and go with him in the air, and uh, that uh, will be ashamed when he comes. Not only confidence at the rapture, but confidence at the judgment seat of Christ. In chapter 4, verse 17, that uh, occurs after the rapture. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Here again leads me to believe that John has read 1 Corinthians 3, where Paul speaks of the judgment seat of Christ. And then 
uh, one of the great promises, of course, of uh, the Christian life is found in John chapter, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, John says, Now are we the children of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You ought to circle this verse carefully and uh, take comfort uh, when you bury a loved one with this verse here. If that loved one is a believer, that you'll see that believer again, you'll be able to recognize him, and this sheds uh, just uh, much light on the nature of the resurrection body. We'll have a body like Jesus had when he rose again from the dead. It was a recognizable body, and it was a body that could move around. It was a body that um, could eat, and it was a body that had flesh and bones. Uh, you need some time to compare 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, with uh, Luke chapter 24, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. These are the great resurrection chapters uh, dealing with the nature of the body of the believer, a body of flesh and bone. Jesus told the disciples, uh, they were terrified. He said, touch me, handle me. He said, I'm not some Halloween spook or spirit. But see, he said, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone as I have. So we're going to be like he is. We're going to have uh, the body, the kind of body that Jesus had, a spiritual and yet a physical body. And what a blessed promise this is of the fellowship in the family. And then Roman numeral 9, the witnesses to this fellowship. In chapter 5, verses 6 and 8, this is he that came by water and blood. This is that. So I'll start that again. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And uh, as it is in the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. Now, as you can see in our notes there, uh, these are not the easiest verses to interpret, uh, but uh, he seems to be talking basically about an external witness here and an internal witness. The external witness is the water and the blood, and the water and the blood here may refer to the baptism and the death of Christ, and the internal here uh, witness would be that of the Holy Spirit. And what he may be saying is this, uh, that... Uh, uh, the external witness in heaven to guarantee uh, us of our fellowship is the twofold work of Christ on earth. That's the external work. Uh, the water, and that uh, identifies him with, uh, and water, of course, uh, speaks of baptism, and baptism identifies Jesus with the sinner. And then the blood, and that speaks of justification for the sinner. So you have water, identification with the sinner, and that's one of the witnesses, and blood, justification for the sinner. One speaks of baptism, the Jordan, the other speaks of Calvary. Now, that may not be a satisfactory interpretation, and that may not do anything for you, and I'm not sure it does a lot for me. But as I say, these are not easy verses to interpret. And then the internal spirit, uh, would, the internal witness would, I would think, of course, be uh, the Holy Spirit here, and not the human spirit. And Paul says that we have been given the earnest of the Spirit. Well, at any rate, uh, the implications of this witness is this, that a twofold witness is all that is necessary for men, because the Bible says, out of the mouth of two or more witnesses shall every truth be established. But here, God has given us a threefold witness, that this fellowship will be continued. Now, Roman numeral 10, and the final in the first epistle of John, the separation from this fellowship. Once again, you have the source, the purpose, the requirements, the test, the maintenance, the family members, the enemies, the promises, the witnesses to and of this fellowship, and then the separation from this fellowship. 
uh, these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six little words in John chapter 5, verse 16. There is a sin unto death. Uh, much theology, I think, is involved in these little words. And uh, briefly speaking now, I believe that the sin unto death, and we've discovered this, uh, we've talked about this a number of times. This is the first time it's actually come out and and uh, uh, named the sin. It's called by other names, perhaps. But what is the sin unto death? And in my opinion, the sin unto death takes place when a child of God, and I believe only a child of God can commit this sin, a child of God so hardens his heart or gets out of the will of God and and refuses to come back to God because of various things in his life uh, till finally he crosses a line or he reaches a point uh, where God steps in and removes him uh, that he might not foul up the works of grace anymore down on earth. And I think I have gotten into this before and given an illustration. Here's a, here's a parent, a mother, and perhaps a father that have uh, a number of children, and they said, all right, now, kids, you can play outside until 6 o'clock or whatever, and then you're going to have to come in and eat. If you behave yourself, well, little Willie gets in a fight, and, and so Mom straightens it out, and... She says, now, I've told you, uh, Willie, you're, you're causing trouble today. Now, if, you, if I catch you fighting, you're going to come in early. And uh, so soon uh, she hears a noise, and this time Dad goes out. And sure enough, Willie's uh, causing problems again. So he says, all right, young man, you come in right now. Uh, you can't stay out as long as the other kids can. You've got to come in now. now. All the kids have to come in eventually, but you've got to come in right now. And I think this is a legitimate and scriptural and Christ-honoring interpretation of the sin unto death. Uh, I think probably only eternity will reveal how many, perhaps untold millions of believers, have been guilty of committing the sin unto death. I think Paul might have been a little concerned about that in 1 Corinthians 9. He says that I keep under my body and uh, I'm like a top sergeant, and I ride herd on this uh, body of flesh and blood. He said, lest that when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. And, uh, of course, the word castaway in the Greek is a uh, re reference to I would be disallowed by God, or I would be set on a shelf. I would be disapproved by God. I would be, uh, as a baseball player, perhaps, uh, who got out of uh, practice and everything, he sent to the showers early. And that's what Paul did not want to do. And uh, I think there are a number of people, perhaps uh, in the Old Testament also, uh, that uh, committed the sin unto death, uh, if it could be committed back then. I, I, believe, uh, I believe Samson would have been a prime example of one who did. And uh, certainly in the New Testament, we have, I think, some clear-cut cases of those who commit, uh, have committed the sin unto death. Uh, a husband and wife may be... Uh, two of the uh, first individuals who have done that, some of the first individuals. The man's name was Ananias, and the woman's name was Sapphira. Remember there in Acts chapter 5. Uh, well, you probably say they weren't even Christians uh, because uh, that Paul was, or Peter was referring to an unsaved person. They lied to the Holy Spirit, and uh, they weren't even saved. But there's one little word in Acts chapter 5 that proves beyond the shadow of a doubt they were saved. And it's the little word W-H-Y in Acts 5, verse 3. Let me read those passages. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also knowing of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, and then he talks now to Ananias, he said, Ananias, Why? Has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? Why have you done that? Now, folks, you don't ask an unsaved person why they drink. If you do, you're, you're not asking them the right question. Why do you drink? Well, they drink because they're unsaved. What you need to ask them is, wouldn't you like to know the Savior? But after they get saved, and then you still find them drinking, then you rightly should ask the question, why are you now drinking? You're saved. You belong to God's family. You're, 
You're to enjoy the fellowship of God's family. And one of the rules, gang, in this fellowship is you don't drink. Why are you drinking? Now, you don't ask an unsaved person why they lie. They just lie because they're unsaved. But now when they got saved, uh, Peter said, why are you doing this? You're saved. You're, you're a member of the church in Jerusalem here. So, uh, no doubt in my mind, they were saved. But God took them both home early. So the sin unto death apparently is being, uh, in a sense, as there is just as sure as there is a uh, sin, uh, a premature birth, there is a premature death. Being taken out of this life before one would normally expect to go. And then I think uh, another classic example of the sin unto death is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, I think it's verse 30 and 31, uh, Paul says uh, a group of Corinthian believers were fussing and fighting among each other at the communion table of all things. And so he says, don't do that because he said, for this cause, he said, many are sickly among you. Many of you folks uh, have diseases that, that uh, all the medicines and prayers in the world cannot cure because you're being punished by God. Here's one little incident when the faith healers are right. Sometimes God does punish uh, our sin with sickness. Some sickness is a result of sin. Not all, but some. So he said, for this cause many are sickly, and he said, many sleep. That is to say, sleep the sleep of death among you. Why? Because I think... He's saying here that many of you have lost, you buried moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas and uncles and aunts and, and uh, children. You buried them because they've committed the sin unto death. Well, the bottom line of the whole thing is this, that the Bible teaches that my union with Christ is so strong that nothing can break it, but my communion with Christ is so fragile that the slightest sin can shatter it. This is the book of the fellowship. Are you in fellowship right now as you listen to this tape? Think about the actions that may have transpired over the last few hours or last few days. You fussed with your wife, sir, or uh, ma'am. Are you angry at your husband? Are you snapped at the children? Are you holding a grudge against the pastor? Are there habits in your life that you know are displeasing to God? Uh, if that's the case, then these three lectures on the Epistle of Fellowship are just academic lectures and they'll mean nothing to you. But I hope it's far more than that. And remember, if right now you find yourself out of fellowship, then what you need to do when this tape is completed is simply bow your head and close your eyes and pray the prayer that will restore this lost fellowship. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, that's what you need to do, and that's what I need to do. Since making these tapes, it's been a period of about two weeks. I've been to Chicago, and I've been to various other cities, and I'll make one and come back. And I want to tell you, I have had to literally pray this prayer a number of times. I missed a plane connection, and oh, I was out of fellowship. And uh, I got a letter that bothered me, and I got out of fellowship. And I heard a rumor about a staff member, and I got out of fellowship. And uh, there was a couple of times that I felt I was too busy to pray, and I went a day or so without praying, and I got out of fellowship. I've had to claim this verse, and maybe you will too when you close uh, this tape. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, A-L-L, -L, unrighteousness to this fellowship.